Yeah, I think it's time to start. So welcome everybody to the uh, Jagiellonian University Theoretical Computer Science Department seminar. And our guest today is Marcelo Campos, who like half a year ago finished his PhD uh, at IMPA in Rio de Janeiro with Rob Morris. Recently was working in uh, Oxford with Peter Kivas and now he's at Cambridge. So, and Marcelo will tell us about exponential improvement for diagonal Ramsey numbers. So please, Marcelo, the screen is yours. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Andre, for inviting me. For, thank you all for, for coming. Um, yeah, so today I'm going to talk about this is all joint work with Simon Griffiths, who's at uh, PUKI, the university in Rio, uh, Rob Morris, who's at IMPA, uh, which is a math institute there, and Julian Sasabuda, who's also in Cambridge. Um, okay, so today I'm going to talk about uh, fit, what I'm going to talk about today fits in Ramsey theorem, Ramsey theorem, which is a more broadly an area of math that studies finding ordered substructures among any type of structure you like. And in general, what you the general setup is that you have some structure and you give it some coloring. So you color it with finally many colors, sometimes infinitely many colors, but let's let's think about finally many colors. And then you want to find some substructure that, uh, for instance, just has one color. Uh, so the type of structure you could want to color is like a graph. You color the edges of the graph or a hypergraph, you color the edges of the hypergraph. Could be the set of integers. So you color each integer with one color. Could be the set of real numbers or, or real, real to the D. And then you want to find some type of substructure which uh, has... Uh, which is monochromatic, so all, all the all the um, components in the substructure has the have the same color. So, for instance, it could be a graph that all the edges have the same color, an AP such that all elements have the same color, or some kind of arithmetic pattern like this x y x, x times y, which was recently solved uh, by Joel Moreira, or like this, uh, or you could find the vertices of a polytope, which all have the same color. So there's, today, this is a very broad, broad area of math that started like maybe 90 years ago, and it really expanded, and there's a lot of stuff to do. And there, there are interesting stuff to study, both in the quantitative aspect. So you could have, um, which is what we're going to study. So how big of a structure you need to color to always find like a given substructure, which is monochromatic. So we'll, we'll hone down that in a minute. Or a qualitative aspect, which is uh, maybe you don't mind the size of the structure you're talking about. So it could be like infinite, like could be the whole set of integers, but you just want to know if you color finally many colors, if you always get some like given type of substructure, like this X, Y, X times Y result was proven like in uh, just coloring the integers, infinite, infinite integers, and not in like this, this uh, finite type of, of, quantitative type of aspect. So today we're going to talk about this quantitative aspect, and we're going to talk more specifically about Ramsey's theorem, which is about graphs, and which is about this, like, maybe one of the simplest types of graphs, which is just the complete graph. So you just have uh, the graph on n vertices with all the edges, and you color it, the setup is that you color it red and blue, like you color, we're just going to use two colors here. So just color the edges with red and blue, and you want to know if you have a monochromatic copy of the complete graph in K vertices, KK. Uh, so a red copy or a blue copy of that. And the Ramsey number, the K Ramsey number, is the minimum N such that all red-blue colorings of the complete graph have a monochromatic copy of KK. And at first, if you've never seen this in your life, it's strange because it's not even clear if this number is well-defined, right? It's not clear that for all K, there is an N such that if you are large enough, you all, you can always find a, a for any coloring, a, a red a clique or a blue clique of size uh, K. But what Ramsey first showed was that this number exists is always finite. And... Um, and so, 
And so this is why this theorem is named after him and the area is named after him because this was one of the first theorems in this direction. And his result is much more general, works for hypergraphs and more colors. Um, and it will also be useful to talk about when the cliques aren't the same size. So imagine you want a red clique of size K or a blue clique of size L. So this is the off, what we call the off diagonal Ramsey numbers. So RKL, and we are also gonna talk about those. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so the game then was that uh, we wanted to get actual bounds, like find out what these numbers are, because, okay, we know they are finite, but it's not a very satisfying answer, right? Like we, we want to know what they are. Like if I give you a number, four, five, five, six, and well, for small numbers, you can actually like calculate them up to a point. So for R3, so you want to find a, a red triangle or a blue triangle in a, in a com complete graph, uh, R3 is six. And so to show a lower bound, you just need to show a coloring of a graph with five vertices that doesn't have any, any monochromatic triangles. And you can do that. It's this coloring here, like this funny thing here. And it has no uh, blue or red triangles. And then to show a, an upper bound, what you need to do is that is to show for every coloring a way to find uh, a red triangle or a blue triangle. And the way you can do that is by, you take a vertex and you look at the majority coloring coming out of it. So it has either three uh, red neighbors, three red edges coming out of it, or three blue edges coming out of it. If it has three blue edges with a lot of generality, you just look at the neighborhood here, like the blue neighborhood. And if it has any blue edges here, then you find a blue triangle, and if it's all red edges, then you find a red triangle. So that's it. Um, and then you can show that R4 is equal to 18, and that's harder. So like the lower bound is coloring according to quadratic residues mod 17, and then the upper bound is like, you need to do a bunch of case analysis, but you can do it, and it's 18. And then R5, we already don't know. So you do, the bounds are between 43 and 48, but even with computers, you can't find the, the correct answers. And both of these bounds are, are are by computers, right? And then R10, the gap is already pretty wide. Uh, so, okay, so we would like to maybe find try to find some general bounds for these numbers, since uh, even for small numbers, we can't compute them. And the first general bound for them was proved by Arish Zakrash in 35, which they showed that RK is essentially smaller smaller than 4 to the k over root k, essentially. Uh, so the main term here is this 4 to the k. And, uh, and this bound, maybe you don't think it's too good yet. Like you maybe, ah, maybe the growth is not polynomial. Maybe it's something smaller. Sorry, exponential. Maybe it's, it's smaller. But uh, subsequently, uh, I had to show that actually this thing grows uh, exponentially uh, fast, so it, it showed a lower bound of root 2 to the k, and his method, the method he introduced to show this lower bound was, uh, is the probabilistic method, so he just did, uh, he showed that a random coloring with positive probability has, uh, has no red kk or blue kk, and with this many vertices. And this bound was only improved one time in 75 by a factor of two by Spencer using the Lovus local one, basically. Uh, but the same probabilistic method. And to this day, we don't know how to construct, like explicitly construct graphs which have um, exponentially many edge, many vertices in K and also uh, in the, um, in the, construct colorings which don't have a blue or red KK and have exponentially many, many vertices. So the only way we know how to generate these things is randomly basically. Okay. And then Eric Zekrash bound uh, stood the test of time for, for a long time. So basically the, um, the improvements people did on it were uh, nobody could improve like the um, the exponential bit, he, bit here. So the exponent was between 4 to the k and root 2 to the k. And then 
there were some improvements in the lower order terms. So Rado did improve this in the 80s by a log factor, uh, essentially using this um, this theorem by Itai Komlos Zimmerdi. And, and then Thomason improved it by a factor of root k, uh, Colo improved it by a super polynomial factor, did the super, first super polynomial improvement to this. And then Sa improved it, uh, he really um, perfected Colo's methods and got it to the, the point where there's a natural barrier here at this, at this point where Sa proved it. And all of these three papers, Thomason, Colo, and Sa, are using uh, quasi randomness uh, which then became some a very prolific area in extreme old combinatorics, and to this day is like super interesting. There are super interesting results relating to it, so it became became quite useful. And this Thomason paper was one of the first applications of it. Okay, and then the main thing I want to talk to you about today is that we did this uh, an exponential improvement to this uh, edge Zekrash bound. And um, so what we show is that there exists some absolute constant epsilon and some delta gradient and also some absolute constant del delta gradient zero, such that for all K and L uh, here should be, I should say large enough. So this doesn't hold, sorry, for all, really all K and L, though maybe you can, if K and L are small enough, then you can use maybe uh, some other bound and then you just, plug our bound in when KNL are larger than like 100 billion or something. Uh, okay, but then uh, what happens is that RK is smaller than four minus epsilon to the K. So the exponent is really smaller than four. And um, RKL would also did an exponential improvement to the bound that um, Erd Zekrash proved, which was K plus L to Zell. And it's worth remarking that our proof works especially well in the off-diagonal case when L is much smaller than K. So if when K is equal to L, our proof works and it gives like some small improvement here. So it gives, um, I think in our paper, like how we do the calculations, we get, get epsilon like 0 0.01 essentially. So this is 3.99. Uh, if you really like try to optimize everything in the computer, I think you get something like 3.95, I think, something around there. That, um, But then for the off-diagonal case, we can get like this constant delta here to be something much better. Like if L is much smaller than K, delta could be maybe like one third or in the paper, I think we, we prove it with one tenth here. Um, okay, but, uh, and then, so the objective today is to talk a bit about the proof of this. So first I'll go through the artist Zekrash proof, and then uh, I'll I'll try to say how we modify the their proof to 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 get this this result. So the the idea is that we have a, an algorithm that can find uh, blue or red uh, KK uh, more effectively than the original artist Zekrash algorithm. So are there any questions about any anything here? Okay, so so first I'll present uh this Erdos Zekrash proof. So the idea that of the Erdos Zekrash proof is that you build uh cliques uh either a red clique or a blue clique with when the vertex out of the red clique will be this A and the vertex out of this blue clique will be this B, uh using now an algorithm. So the initial setup of the algorithm is that you start with some set X, which is the like your set of active vertices, and you start with A and B, or your clicks you want to build empty. And throughout the algorithm, what we'll build at every step of the algorithm, we'll have the following structure. We'll have that all the edges incident to A are red, and all the edges incident to B are blue. And... Um, and then X is like uh, our set of active vertices where we'll get the, the vertices to A or to B and then discard whatever is not, um, doesn't satisfy this property. So if the picture doesn't look like this, so we want the picture to always look like this essentially. And we don't mind what is happening inside of X. Okay, so what are we doing? 
we take w inside of x and if uh the red degree of w inside of x is at least uh x over two then we are gonna add w to a here and then x is gonna we're gonna substitute x by just the red neighborhood of w inside of x and then we're gonna discard everything else right so we discard maybe half the vertices of x here and if the um, so there's a red R here, it's red degree. Otherwise, we are gonna add W to B and we're gonna restrict X to be the blue neighborhood of W inside of X. So this way, if we do it the algorithm this way, we always maintain this property that all the edges incident to A are red and all the edges incident to B are blue. And additionally, what's happening is that every time we do a step, the size of A plus the size of B is like is getting bigger by one. So we just increase either the size of A or the size of B. And the size of X will shrink by a factor of at most two. Because we only add a W to A if the it has at least uh, half the the half the of its neighborhood is red. So at least half of its neighbors are are sending red edges. Otherwise we add it to B. And so you also just make X go down by a factor of, of two if you add it to B because then the blue neighborhood is at least half. Um, and so if we just keep this algorithm going, at some point, the size of A plus the size of B will be larger than 2K minus one. And so it means that the si either the size of A is larger than K or the size of B is larger than K. And we can keep this running for 2K minus one algorithm uh, two k minus one steps, since we are losing a factor of two at each step, as long as the initial number of vertices is at least four to the k. So this is the the co only condition we need to to be able to keep running this algorithm for two k steps. And in that case, we are done because um, if we keep running it for two k minus one steps, if the size of b is larger than k, then we find find uh, found a. Uh, blue click of size K and not, otherwise we found a red click of size K, right? And notice that this case where the size of A plus the size of B is size 2K is like the worst case scenario for the algorithm. So what could happen, which would be very good for us, that we only need K steps because all the steps we do are actually adding things to A. So we don't need to actually like do 2K steps in the end. If we only do k steps in the end, then the, the bound we get on n will be 2 to the k instead of 4 to the k. So we would show a bound on the Ramsey number of 2 to the k, which would be much better. So the worst case scenario here, we are not finding only one click of size k. We are finding two clicks of size k, which is more than we need, right? Like we don't need the, to find both clicks. We just need to find one of them. So we should try to somehow only do red steps, only add things to a, so that the so or to at least have some bias towards a so have some bias to, bias towards red or some bias towards blue so that we do more red steps than blue steps and this way we don't need to do two k steps in the end we need to do fewer than that and which means that the bound on the Ramsey number will be will be better than force the k. So is everything on the last two slides uh, clear? Any questions? Okay, so uh, from here, the plan is to move on to our algorithm now. So the idea is that, okay, so we need to do something kind of asymmetric. So that's our plan. So as long as we could do like more red steps and blue steps, we would be kind of happy, right? If we could like do substantially more, so at least like have some positive bias towards blue uh, red steps, we will we'll be happy. Um, so the idea is that we want to find actually try to find this structure here called uh, a red book, which is the same type of structure we see here, right? Like this a x is the the same the same thing as show, showing up here, which we call a red book which is just the structure where everything inside of A 
is red and everything between A and X is also red. So this is called a red book. And if we could find a red book AX with uh, the size of X being at least the Ramsey number of K minus A, K, then uh, we would be happy as well. That would be enough for us. Because then what you could do is apply Ramsey's theorem inside of X and find either a blue KK, which we are happy with, or a blue K, uh, or a red clique with size K minus A, in which case you can just join it up with this A here and find a red clique of size K. So it would be enough to find just a, a red clique of size K minus A in side effects here to, to finish the proof. And so that's, that's what all we need here. And so uh, the plan here will be the following. We're gonna try to find this red book uh, with A being sufficiently large in relation to X so that uh, we can just apply then um, the Erdős-Sakrash bound on this quantity here on R, K, K minus A, K to finish the proof, to show that uh, X is large enough to find uh, our our cliques here. So we essentially want to like basically reduce to the off diagonal case kind of. Uh, and that's this is what I said that we want to kind of do an asymmetric algorithm to focus on finding the red book instead of like finding both things symmetrically. Okay, so here's the new setup then. We have some set of like um, reservoir of, of vertices X, which is where we are we are taking our vertices from and adding them either to A or to B. But now there is like a new set Y, such that Y is gonna be always forming a red book with A. And what we hope is that once we finish the all the vertices in X. Either we find a, bl a blue click here, B, or A, Y forms a large enough red book so that we can finish the proof using add a applying add a sacrash bound to this off diagonal thing here, R, K minus A, K. Um, and so the question, we'll be asking some questions to, we'll be running this algorithm on vertices of X. And every point at every point adding adding them either to A or to B and maintaining the this this properties here that all the edges between B and X are blue and inside B are blue and all the edges between A and X and to Y are red and inside A are also red. Okay, and then the main challenge here is to control how much X shrinks and how much Y shrinks as we add vertices to A and to B. Okay. Uh, and by the way, feel free to interrupt me at any point if I'm, I don't know if uh, I'm saying something that doesn't make sense or, or if you just have a question. Uh, okay, so the it is that we wanna keep the density between X and Y uh, large throughout the algorithm so that whenever we add something to A here, we can make sure that Y doesn't shrink too much. So this is gonna be the, the main uh, main goal of, of this algorithm. And why is that important? Is that, well, we can assume by basically by symmetry that we just do like X and Y have the same size in the beginning and the density, the red density between them, can we can suppose is at least a half. So like at least half the edges between X and Y are red in the beginning, we can assume that uh, just by symmetry. And uh, we would like to make sure that this is always, uh, this is never broken. So at least a half minus epsilon of the edges between X and Y at all points in the algorithm will be red. This way, what well, we can suppose that y, every time we add something to a, y is only going to shrink by a factor of one half. And this is gonna be very good because uh, this will mesh very well 
with applying the edge set crash bound to the off diagonal case whenever whenever we finish the vertices next. So as long as we can keep this property, that y is only shown to my factor of a half every time. Okay, so how are we gonna keep uh, y only shrinking by a factor of one half minus epsilon every time? So we aren't going to be able to fully do it, but we'll see. Uh, so the idea is that every time we get some vertex, vertex here next, we wanna, what we wanna keep going on, so sorry, We'll call the density of edges between red density of edges between x and y p here. So this, this remember this p here is just the proportion of red edges between x and y. What we would like to say is that every time you add some some vertex to a, we're gonna take x and transform it into the red neighborhood of x uh, of little x inside this left hand side and also restrict to the red neighborhood of X inside the right-hand side as well. So like we shrink both sets. And now we wanna look at the red density of edges between these two shrunk sets, because we actually wanna like shrink Y to be this, just the red neighborhood and also shrink X to just be the red neighborhood. Like, like just like in a the sacred algebra. And what we'd like to maintain is that the dense, red density doesn't fall too much when we do that. Uh, and maybe we can't maintain that the, it doesn't fall at all, but maybe we can maintain that it doesn't fall by more than epsilon over k. And why epsilon over k is good? Because if we are running k steps in the end, then the, the total amount we will lose after k steps will be exactly epsilon. So we won't only want to lose epsilon uh, density in the end. So then it's always bigger than a half by, minus epsilon. So is it possible to always maintain this property here? And unfortunately, the answer is no, we can't always maintain this property. But uh, what we can, can say is that between X and the red neighborhood of our vertex in the right-hand side, we can maintain this property. So uh, if the density between X and Y is P, we can say that the density between X and this new set here, like just restricting on the left, on the right hand side, will be bigger than always bigger than P. And this argument here to show that is just uh, some convexity type argument. Unfortunately, we can do the convexity type argument on the other side as well. Otherwise, we will we'll be very happy. The proof will be much easier. Um, but yeah, the, the nice thing is that the, like this thing works just by, by some convexity, convexity estimates. So now, okay, so now what do we do? So what if uh, we have some, the red neighborhood here on the left-hand side and the red neighborhood in the right-hand side, the density is in fact smaller than P minus epsilon over K. What do we do then? So the idea is that then, if this is this is the case for, for our vertex, then we can actually get a density boost by restricting uh, both the right left-hand side and the right-hand side. And this density boost will be helpful to us in the future. So the idea is that, okay, we wanna maintain the density um, bigger than like close to a half at all points. And so maybe at some steps we are willing to lose, and then the idea is that we should try to gain the density we lose back by doing this these density boost steps when we can't uh, in the cases that we can't do a red step. So we do a so red step is just restricting to red and red here, and then we can do a boost by restricting to the blue here and restricting to the red here. So just by the fact that the between this red box here and the, the full blob on the left-hand side, the density is P. If the density is smaller than P minus epsilon over K here, then the density to balance out, the density needs to be bigger than P plus this quantity here uh, between the blue and the red here. The density needs to be bigger than this. Um, and 
I should say that beta here, so beta is this mysterious quantity that I haven't mentioned yet, is just the size of the blue neighborhood on the left-hand side. So the size of this is beta x. And so imagine if as long as beta, if beta was quite small, for instance, then this the amount of boost in density we are getting is much bigger than the amount we are losing in density when we do red steps. And that's quite good for us because uh, then in the future, we can do a bunch of, of we are allowed to do a bunch of red steps without uh, messing our density too much. So the objective here is to try to do this, what we call a boost step, so that uh, in the future, we are allowed to do more red steps. Um, are there any questions about this? Okay, so you might be complaining now that maybe beta isn't we don't we don't know what beta is yet, right? Like we, in principle, this blue neighborhood in the left hand side could be quite big, uh, and then it would kind of ruin the point of this because the amount of density boost we are getting is could be smaller than the amount of dense density we are losing when we do red step, so it wouldn't be super helpful to us. So what we do in the diagonal case is that we force beta to be smaller than two fifths by doing blue steps whenever the blue neighborhood of our vertex is larger than two fifths. So if the neighbor blue neighborhood is larger than two fifths, you just do blue steps. And at then at some point you need to stop doing blue steps and then we know that beta will be smaller than two fifths. Uh, so now, like with all like these things in mind, I can finally state what like kind of what our, our our algorithm does. So there are like some additional technicalities, but it's not it's not much more than that. It's just like it's it's really like this is the core of the algorithm basically. So the idea is that if your blue neighborhood is uh, more than two fifths. Then we just do a blue step. So it means that we add the, the vertex to B and we we look at uh, this and we restrict X to the, to the blue neighborhood of our vertex. If otherwise, if there exists some vertex such that you can do this uh, red step without losing too much density, so the density loss is only epsilon over K, then we do a red step. So we add the vertex to A, we restrict X to be the red neighborhood, and we also restrict Y to be the red neighborhood. And finally, there is our boost step, which is the step three, where we do a blue step here. So we, we add the vertex to B, and we, we restrict X to the, the blue. So it's basically like this step here, like step one. But we do one thing that is different, is that we also restrict Y to be the red neighborhood of our vertex, and the exchange there is that if we do we do that in exchange for gaining a boost in density that we are going to be able to use in the future. So I'll just go back to the to the picture here. So the picture is this. So the so just to to remind us. So the first step, kind of step. So the blue step, we just add something to B. The red step, we add something to A. And the, uh, the boost step, we add something to B and restrict Y as well. So you don't fully get this condition here because we do the boost steps. Okay. There's still one wrinkle here, is that whenever we do a boost, we might uh, notice that we are only boosting by this amount here which might be kind of tiny, right? Like imagine we do like everything we do, all the steps we do are always boost steps. So the, the boost steps are kind of bad for us because they are restricting the, the right-hand side. So they're making Y get smaller without getting a, a, making our red book larger, right? Like because it, it's a blue thing instead of a red thing. Uh, and this might not be like a, a good enough boost for us because it's only like, 
epsilon over k. So if you do k of them, in the end, you get one minus beta over beta uh, times epsilon uh, density bigger than the original density, which is was like one half. So it's not like quite super helpful for, to us. Uh, might not be like super helpful to us. Uh, so what we do instead is that we accelerate the boost whenever our density is bigger than one half. So this way we make sure that whenever we are doing too many boost steps in a row, uh, they ex start accelerating. So we need to, at some point, start doing uh, red steps to make the density go down again. Um, so essentially, this is making our boost, our density go, go up exponentially whenever P is greater than one half. And it's going down linearly whenever P is smaller than one half. Uh, so I have a, so the only modification of this is that here in step two, before we were putting epsilon over k, right? And now like in the the boost, the, doesn't matter what you put here, you just get like that, that factor of one minus beta over beta times this thing here. So we just substitute the, the epsilon over k by this thing. So whenever the density is smaller than one half, goes down linearly. Whenever it's bigger than one half, it goes up exponentially. So uh, after a few steps, you need to start doing uh, red steps again after a few boost steps. So I have a picture of this. So the idea is that, okay, whenever you're close to, to one half, you're just doing a linear thing. And then as you start getting bigger, you start growing exponentially. So you need to start going down. And you also go down exponentially fast. But that's not a problem to us because uh, all we need, all we want is to keep the density always bigger than one half minus epsilon. And we are successfully doing that since even if we do uh, k uh, red steps in a row, we only lose uh, at most epsilon, right? The density is always bigger than one half minus epsilon if this one. OK, so now we have basically all, all the, the pieces in place for, for us to finish. So we have this algorithm. And basically, the proof is now, OK, we just need to analyze this algorithm, and it will give us a proof of, of our, our bound on the Ramsey number. So it will give a bound which is better than uh, edge Sacrish. So in other words, we will give a more efficient algorithm for finding either red or blue clues. And uh, so how, how do we do the analysis of this? So we say T is the number of red steps and S is the number of, sorry, it's not blue steps, it's boost steps, steps of type three. Um, and what we can show is that S is at most beta over one minus beta times t plus little k. Okay. So essentially, every time you do a boost step, your density goes up goes up by one minus beta over beta times something. And every time you go, you go down, you go down by like one times the same thing. So the proportion between uh, s and t should exactly be this beta over one minus beta um, because otherwise you, you should basically blow up here. So if your S is much larger, is larger than than this this quantity here, then what happens is that your density blows up and it gets bigger than one, which is a contradiction. So that's essentially the how we prove this lemma, which we call the zigzag lemma, essentially because of this picture. And this is like the one of the most technical bits of the of, of the paper. And then with this in with this bound in our in our hands, now we're kind of ready to show what's happening. So all we need to analyze is how much the size of X and how much the size of Y go down as we run the algorithm. And if we show that it doesn't go down by as like by so much, then we are done. So we are happy. That's that's basically what all we need to show. So the objective is to try to find a, a big red book so to show that a time a y is a, a big red book so we just need to show for instance that the size of y is large enough at, at the end of the algorithm 
Okay, so how do we control the size of x? So just run the arg term until the size of x is like two to the little k. And we know that um, on the other hand, every time we do uh, a step one in the arg term, so just going back here, every time we do step one here, the size of x goes down by a factor of two fifths, right? So we get two fifths to the k minus s, since s is the number of boost steps coming from, from the steps of type one. Steps of type two, you go down by a factor of three fifths because you didn't do step step one. So it means that your, your blue density is at most two fifths. So like your blue neighborhood is at most two fifths. So your red neighborhood must be at least three fifths of, of your total, total number of vertices. So you get three fifths to the number of, of red steps here. And finally, we get this quantity beta, right? And here we're kind of assuming that every time we do a boost step, the um, we are going to go down by a factor of beta, and which is not strictly true, right? We, like we could vary how much we are going down when whenever we do a step three, whenever we do a boost step. But um by convexity, we can essentially show by essentially AM GM inequality. We can essentially show that the best thing to do for the adversary, like the worst thing for us, is if all the steps do go down by all the boost steps are going down by the same amount, which is always the same beta. And it's the same beta they're showing up here, essentially, right? It's the it's the proportion that our blue neighborhood is taking whenever we are doing a boost step is this beta. And uh, the nice thing is that now we can bound beta in terms of T and S, right? If we just rearrange these things, we can say that uh, beta is at most S over T plus S by rearranging this inequality. And so this beta is not a mysterious thing anymore. It's just going to be some function of T and S. And that's quite helpful to us because now this thing is just like some function of k, t, and s, like this this whole thing, and n, right? And then n is the, the amount of vertices we started with. So, and then to analyze how much the size of y goes down is simpler because every time we know that density is not get, getting smaller than uh, one half minus epsilon. So every time the size of y can go down by at most one half minus epsilon and what are the steps that can make the size of y go down? It's only the red steps or the boot steps, right? In the first, in the blue steps, the steps one of the type one, right? We don't alter the size of y at all. So only step three and and two and three alter the size of y, and it goes down by a factor of one half every time. So we know that the size of y is going to be at least uh, one half to the t plus s times n. And if the size of y was larger than uh, r k minus t k, we would be done because we found a red book of the size we wanted, right? Like it's it's the this is good enough for us. So now we just have like we have these two inequalities here, and now we can use some inequality here on r k minus t k that is given to us by bounds on Ramsey numbers given by Erdos Sekrash, right? Like Erdos Sekrash gives a bound on this, which is like 2k minus t, choose k minus t, right? And if we can just plug in this thing here, and now we just have like two inequalities that is just some numerical estimates, right? Because it's not, there's not no Ramsey theory going on anymore apart from this. Like once we, use some bound of this. There is no Ramsey theory going on here anymore. It's just like some numerical bounds and then you just need to work out uh, what the numbers give you. Um, okay, so before I, I tell you what the numbers give us, should, do we have um, any questions on, on bounding the sizes of X and Y or the zigzag lemma or maybe boost steps or return, anything? Yeah, I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, so why you are assuming the threshold two over five? It seems from this lemma that some threshold depending on beta or k could 
it has some better bound or it's not it's negligible right so one one problem is that um so we found two fifths by computer op optimization so it's not like a um so it's not a, like a number that's yeah that's like we don't have like a good reason for it like essentially so this proof there is it's still kind of mysterious like how it works for the diagram case it works very well for alpha in the case but the problem we can't assume the threshold depends on beta because we don't know what beta is uh essentially we don't know what beta is before our hand right because beta will depend on the threshold we choose like the adversary will choose beta depending on on the on what we do what on what uh the algorithm does though what you could do and we haven't tried that but that that might give us give you better results is changing the threshold as the algorithm goes along so this might give you a numerical improvement so if you change the two fifths as you go along in the algorithm maybe uh depending on what s and tr along the algorithm this this it's true that this might give a, you a, an improvement here but we haven't tried that yet so this is a, an interesting direction to go. Thanks. Um, okay, so we can now bound by this zigzag lemma. We can bound beta by is this it's just s over t plus s here. So it's just this. This is all just some function of uh, s t uh, n and k, right? So these four things. And now we just can just plug in that uh, we assume that n is like 3.99 to the k, and we want to see what happens to this to this business. So, okay, so I'll explain what this graph means now. So essentially, what we can plot here is that we are gonna we are using the Erdosek crash bound for the size of the book here. So we're using Erdosek crash for this this thing. In this graph and so it's just now it's, everything's numerical so this this axis is just s over k this axis is just t over k and we're assuming here n is like 3.9999999 to the k something like that and the red region is the region of s and t where the um, we aren't able to find a large enough red book so the red book we find isn't large enough, so we can't just win by applying Erdős Sekrash. And the blue region is essentially the region that your algorithm forces you to fall into. So it means the blue region is the region where you finished all, all the vertices in, in X. So when you finish the algorithm, so you finish the algorithm whenever you finish all the vertices in X, it means that you're following the blue region and if the blue region doesn't intersect the red region, we're happy because then it means that we're always able to find the red book. So the red region is the region where we don't find the red book, which is large enough. Unfortunately, if we are using the edges that crash bound for the size of, of this thing here of RK minus TK, then these two regions do intersect. So that's quite unfortunate. So it means that our proof doesn't quite work. It, all, it doesn't give like 3.999 to the K. Maybe it gives like 4.01 to the K. So it's, it's like a worse version of Erdos And you can see they have like a very slight intersection here. So it almost works, but it doesn't quite work. Uh, but of course, uh, the proof works eventually. So what you, we can do then is that, okay, we don't need to actually use Erdos to bound this. We can actually apply our algorithm out again, but in the off diagonal case, and it works better than than and Erdos so we can get a better bound on this R K minus T K here, and our algorithm works much better in the off diagonal case even because the boosts we get in the boost steps are much larger than the than the in the diagonal case. So it's like it's it's much nicer here, and then by plugging in the bound we get on this this thing here, we actually get this other image where the two regions don't really intersect, which means that we can always find the red book. And 
okay, maybe you can't see in this picture that the regions don't intersect, so I zoomed in a bit. So you can see here that they almost intersect, but they don't quite. So it means that like this proof here I gave you shows something like 3.9999 to the K. And then there is like some trick we can do that uh, in the beginning that actually gives us uh, improvement over this, that gives like 3.99 instead of like four nines. But essentially that's, that's the proof basically. And uh, yeah, and thank you guys.